Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Rubin, alone in the studio as Rabbi Richman is overseas. Today is the 22nd day of the month of Sivan, 5779, 25th day of June 2019. This coming Shabbat here in the land of Israel, we are reading Parashat Korach, uh, which begins in the book of Numbers in chapter 16, verse 1, concludes chapter 18, verse 32. In diaspora, there's still a uh, still a week behind in the diaspora, and they'll be reading this Shabbat Parshat Shalach, which we read and discussed last week. This coming Shabbat also is Shabbat Mavarachin, the Shabbat uh, in which we will be blessing the upcoming new moon of Tammuz, which is a two-day Rosh Chodesh, a two-day beginning of the month which begins on Tuesday evening, Wednesday, Wednesday evening, Thursday, Tuesday evening, Wednesday actually being the final 30th day of the month of Sivan, but it is the first day of the Rosh Chodesh celebration. Wednesday evening, Thursday being the first day of the month of Tammuz, a month uh, notorious, I guess, uh, for um, bad things happening, which of course we discussed last week in, the, in discussing Parshat Shalach because it was the month of Tammuz that the 12 spies set out in, uh, in their 40-day sojourn through the land of Israel, and they, ar- they returned back to the encampment in the desert in the 9th of Av, which is the month following Tammuz, but they actually left... Um, from the desert to enter the land in the very final day of Sivan, meaning the entire month of Tammuz was spent inside the land of Israel. And so it is, um, was the Diba, the, the bad report, the evil report they said about uh, the month of, uh, excuse me, about the land of Israel um, sort of taints tainted historically the month of Tammuz and of course uh, ever since the destruction of the second holy temple we have been fasting on the 17th day of Tammuz the beginning of a three-week period uh, which culminates in the fast of the ninth the day that the temple was destroyed and of course the temple was destroyed on that day as we learned because uh, According to Midrash, God said to the people of Israel, you're crying over nothing. You know, your spies came back. The bad report, fake news, no basis for it. You lost your trust in me. You think I can't overcome some giants, some uh, fortified cities? You think the God who brought you out of Egypt can't handle that? I'll give you something to cry about. So... What that something to cry about was, of course, the the mourning for the loss of the Holy Temple, which has consumed our people for many generations now. But God willing, we're on the path now toward rebuilding the Holy Temple. And uh, hopefully soon, in our days, we will no longer be fasting on the 9th of Av, but actually celebrating as they did during the time of the second holy temple the fast of the ninth was actually uh, established by the prophet Zechariah uh, after the destruction of the first holy temple which also was destroyed on the ninth so during the second temple the temple was rebuilt so the ninth was no longer a fast day but during that time it was the beginning of a seven day uh, festival celebration, not a uh, not a Torah-based uh, uh, s- uh, festival, as in uh, Shavuot or Sukkot or or Passover, Pesach, but a seven-day uh, holiday that was called by the sages, which began on the ninth and concluded on of all days the fifteenth of Av, which, as we know, the fifteenth of Av, otherwise known as Tuba Av is to this very day a day of uh, celebration. So, God willing, soon 
will be spending seven days celebrating as opposed to three weeks mourning and, and contemplating uh, the loss of the Holy Temple and um, planning on how we're going to fix that uh, loss by rebuilding the Holy Temple, God willing, when the people are all together and we go to our government and say, now's the time. And our democratically elected government says, this is what the people want, this is what we're going to do. You can agree with me or disagree with me on that. This week's Parsha, Korach, had a very great man named Korach. And it opens up like this. It opens up in Hebrew. Like, like I said, it's uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 16, verse 1. Vaikach Korach ben Yitzhar ben Kahat ben Levi v'datan v'aviram b'nei Eliav b'nei Eliav v'on ben Pelet b'nei Reuven Okay. Opens up like this in English. This is how it's uh, translated in the uh, stone edition. Korach, son of Yitzhar, son of Kohat, son of Levi, separated himself with Datan and Aviram, sons of Eliav and On, son of Pelet, the offspring of Ruvain. Okay. In the Hebrew, it doesn't start with the name Korach, but it starts with the word Vayikach. Vayikach Korach ben Yitzhar ben Gahat ben Levi. It starts like this, and I'll translate literally. And Korach took. Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kahat, Kahat, son of Levi, took with Datan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav, and On, the son of Pelet, the sons of Reuven. Okay. So, the stone translation is a of Avayikach as separated himself is actually based on rabbinic tradition, uh, trying to understand what this Avayikach means in this context. Uh, what did he take? So, it rabbis say he took himself aside, he separated himself from, from the congregation. He created a division in the congregation. This already is uh, an ominous development because the key is to be united and there was no reason for any division. Everybody had their assignment, everybody had their task in the desert and uh, they were intended to be moving forward. Um, toward ultimately entering into the land and to separate yourself out of nowhere for no reason apparently. All of a sudden, boom, vaikach korach. Now, if we take the literal meaning of the word vaikach, it means any took. And I think this is a beautiful uh, way to begin this parsha, this Torah reading, because I think it says all we need to know ultimately about Korach, and he took, he was a taker. He took, he took, he took what he wanted. He tried to take what he wanted. He was dissatisfied with his lot. Now it's interesting that he's dissatisfied with his lot, because what do we know about his lot? We learn a lot right here. It says Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi. Okay, the Levi, of course, is the father of of uh, Amram, who's the father of Moshe, and the father of Aaron, and he's the father of all the Levites. So Korach was a cousin of Aaron and Moshe. And in fact, we learned earlier in Parshat Balotcha, uh, in Numbers, we can actually get the verse here. Hold on, excuse me. Uh, oh, here. I'm going even earlier in, in the Parshat Bamidbar. Um, it's Numbers 4. And beginning of chapter 4. 
Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kahat from among the sons of Levi, according to their families, according to their father's household, from 30 years of age and up until 50 years of age, everyone who comes to the legion to perform work in the tent of meeting. Okay, they're talking about the work now uh, that they'll do when it's time to move. Okay, this is um, disassembling the tent of meeting, the, the tabernacle and its vessels, and actually carrying them to the next uh, encampment, next stop on the journey. When the camp is the journey, this is the work of the sons of Gahat in the tent of meeting, the most holy. When the, sun, when the camp is the journey, Aaron and his son shall come and take down the partition curtain and cover the ark of the testimony with it. They shall place upon it a tachash hide covering and spread a cloth entirely of turquoise, that is, tachilet wool, over it, and adjust its staves. Upon the table of the showbread they shall spread a cloth of turquoise, tachilet wool, and place it upon the dishes, the spoons, the pillars, and the shelving tubes, and a constant bread shall remain on it. Okay, and then they go on to also cover the menorah. And then they go on to also uh, take away the, the, the incense altar, the altar. They take away these major holy vessels. That's the job of the sons of Kahat. Who are the sons of Kahat? Well, they include Korach. So Korach, among his brethren, had the task of, of carrying the holiest vessels that were contained in the, in the tabernacle, including the Ark of the Covenant, Arona Brit. He had this incredibly important, incredibly honorable task. What more could he have asked for? Yet, he is exactly asking for more here. Because as we read, and going back to Parshat Korach, after he assembled himself, separated himself uh, with Datan and Aviram, sons of Eliav, and On, son of Pelet, son of Ruvain. Now, why Ruvain? Because Ruvain's encampment was close to the encampment of the uh, sons of Kahat. So he incited uh, the closest people to him to join him. And uh, they stood before Moshe with 250 men from the children of Israel. Back in 16, uh, just read verse 2. Those 250 men included uh, Levites uh, and included these sons of, of Reuven. They gathered together against Moshe and against Aaron and said to them, Is it too much for you? For the entire assembly, all of them are holy, and Hashem is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of Hashem? And uh, he's saying, ostensibly, a very beautiful thing here. Well, wh what makes you the Queen Gadol? What makes you the leader here? We're all holy. So why do you exalt yourselves uh, over the congregation of Hashem? In fact, the Hebrew, Umaduat, Titanasu al Kahal Hashem. The the Hebrew for exalt yourself is, is even more uh, is even sharper. It's hitnasu. Hitnasut is is arrogance. Why do you arrogantly raise yourself uh, above the others? What, who decided that you should be the Kohanim? It's basically what he's saying. Of course, Moshe heard and fell on his face, we're told. Okay, so Korach is doing something very brilliant here. Now, actually, he was a very brilliant man. And our sages tell us there's a tradition that he was a wealthy man. Um, he, meaning that the point is he lacked for nothing. He had wealth. He had stature. He had this incredibly important task. Uh, there's only one thing he didn't have, and that was he wasn't a Kohen. He was a Levite. The one thing he didn't have is the one thing he wanted, apparently. So he made this beautiful statement, hey, we're all holy, every one of us. 
every one of the 600,000, right? We're all holy. So what makes you Moshe, the leader? What makes you Aaron, the high priest? And what makes Aaron's sons the priests, the Kohanim? What about the rest of us? There's a word for this in the modern uh, language, and that's called populism. Yes, he struck a chord. He struck a chord in people. And uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Wait, wait a minute. Um, you know, we've been going along with this till now, but but uh, what's what's it all about? Why why them? Why not us? Okay. So what's going on here? First of all, this is the taking place following the debacle of the twelve spies. So this entire generation now has been condemned, as it were, to dying in the desert. There's no future. No future for them. Right? They're not going into the Holy Land. And uh, they're just going to die here in the desert. So they are disgruntled and easily manipulated. Why not? You know what? We're not, we're not entering the land. All that promise of, of the good things, it's, it's no longer relevant to us. So when someone like Korach comes around and says, uh, you know, why are we listening to them to begin with? Who put them in charge? Um, he, has a, he has a very readily available audience. Now, interesting, interestingly enough, Moshe, who appeared somewhat passive when dealing with the report of the spies uh, seems to have learned a lesson because he immediately takes to the offense here. It says, Moshe heard and fell on his face. But then he says, he spoke to Korach and, his and to his entire assembly, saying, in the morning Hashem will make known the one who is, who is his own and the Holy One, and he will draw him close to himself. And whoever him cho he will choose, he will draw close to himself. Do this. Take yourselves fire pans, Korach and his entire assembly, and put fire in them and place incense upon them before Hashem tomorrow. Then the man whom Hashem will choose, he is the Holy One. Is it, is it too much for you, O offspring of Levi? So Moshe immediately takes control of this situation. He says he spoke to, he spoke to Korach and his entire assembly. And in fact, in the Hebrew, again, it's, it's even more pointed. It's even more pointed. And it says, And it says he spoke to, to Korach and all his assembly. As if, as if, I'm talking to you, Korach. Your assembly... It's, it's in Hebrew, it's adato. It's, it's almost as if he's separating them now from Korach. Korach, this is, I'm talking to you now, man to man. What's your problem? What's your beef? You think I, you think I'm the one who decided I'm in charge? You're not, you're, you're, your complaint isn't against me, he tells Korach. Your complaint's against God. Now, Korach was very clever, and he framed his, his rebellion here against Moshe and Aaron, as if they're the ones who decided that they're in charge. That way, it was easier to gain followers, right? We're not, uh, you know, we're all holy. So who said that God appointed Moshe and, and Aaron? But of course we know that not only did God appoint Moshe and Aaron, but God appointed Moshe, uh, a very reluctant Moshe, a very reluctant Moshe who has been the man in charge God's uh, God's shaliach, God's uh, prophet here uh, from the very start. That's been very clear. So Moshe, again, he comes right back at Korach. He separates him from his followers. He gives him a tongue lashing. He says, who do you think you are? You're not satisfied with what you've got. You're already a, Lev a Levite. You're a Levi. You have a, you, your inheritance is, is the holy is the, is the tabernacle. It's the, it's the holy temple. Yes, when we enter the land, the Levites won't have a, a nachala, an inheritance of land. 
but they will serve Hashem. And now you want more? What you got isn't enough? And then, not only that, but he decides how they're going to determine who God has chosen. And of course, that's with the fire pans. And he determines, also says, we're doing it tomorrow, meaning that Korach has no... You know, I'm talking now, really, it's like real politics. Korach, was, his rebellion was really a, a political move. It wasn't... He tried to act as if it were a, you know, an, a, a purely motivated uh, response, purely motivated rebellion. A question, in fact, uh, our sages say that he actually asked a question, as it were, a halakhic question. He said, you know what? Uh, we, we had just learned in the end of Shalach, we had just learned about tehillat, about trying the two s blue strings to our garments, to the four corners of our garments. And Korach says to Moshe in the Midrash, he says, well, what if a person's wearing a, a, a garment that's entirely blue, entirely tehillat? Does he still wear to ne need to wear strings? So he's asking a wise guy question here. It was a, you know, it wasn't a real question. It was, he was trying to embarrass Moshe. He was trying to, to uh, put him in a difficult position. In fact, it's interesting that he chose that as well because as we know, all the, all the uh, vessels that Korach and his fellow Kahatim, sons of Kahat, had to move, they first had to cover with, 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 uh, uh, with Tachelet, with, uh, um, fabrics of Tehillet. Now Tehillet also was a very, very, very uh, expensive and powerful uh, dye. It wasn't easily uh, acquired and it was the, the blue of, of royalty. Uh, so Kahat, who was a very wealthy man, could envision himself uh, wearing a, a, a garment that's completely made of, of, of Tehillet. Of course, only the high priest wears his tunic, which is completely made of Tehillet. Um, so Kahat, who was in a world of his own because he was very wealthy, could come up with such an illusion as a garment completely of Tehillet, something that his followers could never uh, even aspire to. Here's the music. We'll be right back to Temple Talk. by Richmond is the United States and this coming Sunday, June 30th, he will be speaking in Lubbock, Texas at the South Plains Hebraic Center this coming Sunday, the 30th of June. Rabbi Richmond and Rena Richmond will both be speaking in Lubbock, Texas. For more details uh, and contact information, you can uh, go to our uh, website, templeinstitute.org, or our Facebook page, and find uh, the details. We have been talking about Parshat Korach, which is what we're reading here in Israel this coming Shabbat, beginning on the uh, chapter 16 of the book of Bamidbar, Numbers. In d the diaspora, there is still a discrepancy, which will continue for the next few weeks, between what we're reading here and what you're reading there. In the diaspora, you are a week behind, and we'll be reading Parshat Shalach, the Parsha of the Twelve Spies. Uh, this coming Shabbat also is Shabbat Mavarachin, in which we will be uh, making a blessing for the upcoming new moon and Rosh Chodesh of the month of Tammuz, uh, which will begin Tuesday night, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, two-day Rosh Chodesh, and we've been talking about Korach, the man who would be king, <laughs> the man who would be high priest, the man who would be Moshe and Aaron all wrapped up in one, I guess, and the man who sought to incite uh, the children of Israel against their leadership. And uh, 
ostensibly take over and, uh, you know, the heck with uh, all those other people. Well, we're all holy, he said. We're all holy. We're all equal. But when, I, when I'm in charge, I'll be in charge and everybody else can wait in line. That's how it is with, uh, with populists. Uh, they will, they will uh, say things that uh, on, the, on the surface are quite true. We're all holy. There's truth in that. But what, that, what does that have to do with uh, the price of tea in China? Uh, you have a leader. You have leadership. Uh, if everybody is, is, is in charge, then what you have is anarchy and chaos. And so Korach was playing with fire. And speaking of fire, I guess Moshe decided if you're going to fight fire with fire. So he immediately retorted with the idea, which was his own idea of this sort of competition with the fire pans. Let's offer incense to Hashem and God will accept the offering of the one he's chosen. Fair enough. How c and you know, once Moshe throws down the gauntlet, What's Korach? Korach is going to say, well, wait, let me think about it? No. <laughs> He's got 250 people with him who are, you know, waiting with bated breath, like, let's do this. You know, he can't, uh, he can't back down. So anyway, Moshe, it's a very brilliant move on Moshe's part because he completely knocked the wind out of, out of, of Korach's sails. Now Moshe's in charge. He's calling the shots. And uh, Korach is simply reacting. Also interesting. Uh, this was Moshe's idea. He didn't. Uh, he didn't say to God, you know, God, well, you know what, what do you suggest? Like, what should I do now? He has done that in the past. He didn't. Only after. Only after uh, he made this challenge, did he speak to Hashem, speak to God, and that's in, in uh, chapter 16, verse 15. This distressed Moshe. He after he also tried to get to some of the people to back down. Uh, but then they didn't, and this distressed Moshe greatly, and he said to Hashem, Do not turn to their gift offering. I have not taken even a single donkey of theirs, nor have I wronged even one of them. And then Moshe again turns to Korach and says, You and your entire assembly, be before Hashem, you, they, and our own tomorrow. Let each man take his fire pan, and you shall place incense on them, and you shall bring before Hashem each man with his fire pan. 250 fire pans in you and our own, each man with his fire pan. Okay. So, Moshe, after he set up this whole challenge, then he talks to, to Hashem, and he says, you know, I, I, I don't know what they want from me. I haven't uh, taken a thing of theirs. I haven't wronged anyone. And all of a sudden, they're, they're coming up with complaints. So basically, Moshe, he didn't say to God, you know, God, like, you got to do this for me. You know, he said, like, this is my case. I don't know what he, you know, Korach, his case is he's got everything in the world except one thing, and he wants that one thing. My case is I haven't wronged anybody. I didn't ask for this job. We know. He didn't state that specifically there, but that's the background. I didn't ask for this job. I, you gave me the job. I haven't wronged anybody. So you know what, Hashem? You decide. Um, you know, Moshe more than once said to Hashem, <laughs> like, I've had enough. Like, please, like, you know, just like, uh, like, put someone else in charge. But this time he says, God, you decide. And of course, we know the result is that God, um, uh, only accepted the offering of Aaron, who was his appointed Kohen Gadol, his appointed high priest. And what to do now with these 250 rebels? So God has sa says to Moshe, you know what? Uh, separate yourself, he says in verse 20. Hashem spoke to Moshe now and saying, separate yourselves from amid this assembly and I shall destroy them in an instant. And then they, Moshe and Aaron, fell on their faces and said, Oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and you be angry with the entire assembly? Again, this is Moshe angry and, you know, and just, he's had enough with these people, but he's a man of justice. 
He's a man of peace. And he says, you know, one guy sins, you're going to wipe away everyone. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the assembly saying, get yourselves up from around the dwelling places of Korach, Datan, and Aviram. So basically God says, okay, give everybody a fair warning. Fair warning. And of course we know the, the result here that uh, Moshe went and said, everybody, everybody uh, back away uh, because if God didn't appoint me, if this was my idea, if I came up with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe the master being the leader, if that was all my own thing, then these people who came up against me now, the Korach and his 250 people, they'll die a natural death. But if not, if I'm the one that God chose and these, these rebels, these, these upstarts are, are guilty, not of... Uh, of sinning against me, but sinning against God, then God will, the earth will open up and swallow them up in a moment. And of course, that's exactly what happened. This putting a lid on the rebellion of Korach, which one would assume would have uh, brought peace back to the encampment. Everybody was seeing, okay, this guy was out of line. Um, he woke up one morning the wrong side of the bed, decided he wanted everything, and using a gift of, a, of a, a slick tongue, was able to convince many to stand with him. Now he's gone. He's out of the picture. But what happened next? The following day, more people came up to Moshe and said, you've killed the people of Hashem. You know, what's going on here? Like, people rise up against you and then they're, now they're dead? Like, it's getting out of hand, it sounds like they're saying. Like, what's going on? And this time, even before Moshe uh, could, could respond, uh, Hashem decides to intervene, and there's a plague, and people start dying. And this plague, it looks like it's gonna consume everybody. I mean, it's, it's fast, spreading fast, and uh, uh, Moshe says, Moshe says to Aaron in verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 11, take the fire pen and put it on fire from upon the altar and place incense and go quickly to the assembly and provide atonement for them. For the fury has gone out from the presence of Hashem. The plague has begun. And Aaron took as Moshe had spoken and ran to the midst, in, to the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague had begun among the people. He placed the incense and pri provided atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and the living and the plague was checked. Those who died in the plague were 14,700, aside from those who died because of the affair of Korach. Aaron returned to Moshe at the, tent, at the entrance of the tent of assembly, and the plague had been checked. Okay, so the second uprising, just as the first one was quelled in, in a, a very uh, unequivocal manner, I mean, the earth opened up, it just doesn't happen. And it opened up just as Moshe said, and at the moment that Moshe said it, well, that just doesn't happen. So you would think after that, that people would be uh, in a state of shock and just lay low. But no, uh, people were agitated. And the following day, they went back to Moshe and, Aaron and said, you know, you're killing people. We're not going to stand for it. And uh, instantly, apparently, this plague began, and it was only Aaron's intervention with the incense, the fire pan of incense that, that uh, provided atonement and quelled the plague. Not until, however, many, many people died. So now, in order to end this series of rebellions, God says, uh, to, uh, to Moshe and Aaron to tell the leaders, the heads of all the 12 tribes to uh, each bring their staff. And they will set up all the staffs uh, outside the tent of meeting and uh, 
God will decide. Every, every staff has the name of the, of the tribe in it, and God will decide who is going to be chosen to, to, to perform the service of the, of the temple, of the, of the tabernacle, which God had already decided, but this will be a confirmation. And of course, as we know, the staff of Aaron uh, grew leaves and fruits, fresh almonds, and that was the sign that he indeed was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest that God had chosen from among the children of Israel. And this sign put an end to these rebellions once and for all. And as a, a monument, a uh, commemoration to this event, God told Moshe that uh, the staff of Aaron should be placed next to the the, to the uh, Ark of the Covenant where it should stay forever as a testimony to uh, the fact that God had chosen Aaron to be the high priest and his sons to be the, uh, the, the priests, the Kohanim, for generations to come. So that was the end of the rebellion of Korach and the subsequent rebellion and uh, the staff of Aaron, in fact, uh, remained next to the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the first holy temple. And um, of course, the Ark of the Covenant uh, was not in the second holy temple, having been hidden away uh, before the destruction of the first holy temple, and is the staff of Aaron still uh, resting against the Aaron Habrit, the Ark of the Covenant to this day in its hidden chamber underneath the uh, Temple Mount as our tradition holds? I don't know, but God willing we'll find that out someday. It was a miraculous staff, so I imagine it could have survived all these thousands of years. So, that was the conclusion of the rebellions. And again, we're in a period now where the older generation of the desert are sort of in limbo. They're not really going anywhere uh, because of the, uh, their response, the despair that they exhibited when the spies came back and, and said, there's no way we can take the land of Israel. Uh, save for Yoshua and Kalev, of course, who said, what are you talking about? Of course we can. God has promised it. God wants us to have it, then we're going to have it. You know, all these themes are so relevant to today. The theme of, 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 of taking the land of Israel, of having confidence in the Shem's promise, of not despairing, of, of, you know, versus those who say, well, we can't, we're going to eat too many there's too many Palestinians here, and the world's against us, and we're not strong enough. What are you talking about? This is, this is God's promise. This is what we're here for. This is the challenge, yes, but of course we can do it. The idea of, of, of populists, you know, stand up and say, why, you know, do it my way. I'm in charge. You know, we're all holy. Why should he be in charge? These are things that happen all the time. People all of a sudden decide, you know, they, they know better. And just put me in charge and you'll see things will be better. You know, the um, Haftarah, the prophetic reading, which we read this Shabbat uh, after the conclusion of reading Korach, is from the book of uh, Samuel. And it describes the story of uh, when the tribes of Israel came to Samuel and said, we want a king. And it's very interesting that that is the, is the Haftorah chosen for, for Parshat Korach, because the Haftorah and, 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 and the Torah reading always have a shared theme. So what's the shared theme? Well, there's a few shared themes. One is that, uh, that this Samuel is actually uh, a descendant of Korach. Samuel was a Levite and a, desc and a descendant of Korach. And uh, 
according to one tradition. And uh, so that, uh, that immediately is, it makes a connection. But the other connection is that Samuel takes offense on God's behalf at the, at the call of the by the children of Israel for a king. He says, you know, who, Hashem's led you till now, right? Hashem brought you out of Egypt. Hashem brought you into the land of Israel. Now you want a king? So the parallel here is that, uh, you know, Moshe and Aaron were appointed by Hashem. So they were also the, you know, Hashem was the one leading Israel out of Egypt through the desert into the land of Israel. It wasn't Moshe and Aaron. They were his appointed uh, messengers, his, app his appointed uh, leaders, as it were. But it was Hashem who was in charge. So, so Shmuel is saying here, now you want a king? Um, you're, like a, you're losing your faith in Hashem? Now, the response was, we're not losing our faith in Hashem. <laughs> we're losing our, our, our confidence in our ability as a tribal uh, federation to be able to uh, face up to our enemies who are growing stronger. Of course, the police team, the Philistines, uh, were growing stronger and, pr and, pr and presenting a, a, a tremendous challenge to the children of Israel. So in effect, they had to clarify what they're asking for. But uh, they said, no, we don't want, we don't want um, someone in place of Hashem, God forbid. We just want someone who will be recognized universally by all the tribes as having the authority to, to uh, lead us and, and uh, by, therefore by leading us as a united nation, uh, we'll be able to defeat our enemies and uh, live uh, in peace and live in the peace that uh, is a prerequisite for the building of the Holy Temple. So, interesting, interestingly enough, um, this was a, a sort of a conversation between Shmuel and the people that had to be clarified before uh, Shmuel would agree to appoint such a king. And of course, he appointed first uh, Shaul, Saul, who was a great man, uh, but not, uh, not necessarily a great king. And then, of course, soon after that, he appointed David, David, who was, of course, the greatest of kings. And uh, interesting parallel to our Korah reading in which one man, one man of privilege decides that uh, he's going to challenge everything that uh, Hashem has done up to this point. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned, his punishment and the punishment of those 250 people who followed him was that they are swallowed up by the earth and according to tradition, they never died. They're just swallowed up by the earth. He separated himself from the congregation. Well, now he's really separated from the congregation. He wanted to be alone. He was aloof. Well, now he's really alone. And uh, they say that he is, he and his ilk and his uh, followers are buried alive in a certain spot in the desert and uh, that uh, they say over and over, Moshe is is the true prophet, and um, and the and the Torah is the true Torah. Meaning that they are confessing that uh, they weren't just qu questioning Moshe's uh, role, but they were questioning the entire Torah. His rebellion was not simply a ultimately a rebellion against the particular leader who he thought had failed him. You know, one could say, listen, Moshe, you know, he. He's not bringing us into the land of Israel. Uh, so he's a failure. Let's pick someone new. No, he was questioning and rebelling against Torah itself and against God. So his rebellion was way, 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 way more serious 
and more insidious than he presented it when he presented it as we're all holy you know almost like a feel-good rebellion we're all holy uh, so what's the problem let's all share leadership here and uh, once we share it I'll grab it so he is eternally underneath that earth and they say and in fact on Rosh Chodesh they say not exactly sure where that tradition comes from but on Rosh Chodesh if you happen to be in that area you can put your head to the ground and you can hear them saying Moshe is the true prophet and the Torah is the true Torah and God is God thanks for being with me Temple Talk